listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to start out with my normal first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? The top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. Most of them are hits. Some of them look to be flops, but I will tell you the difference. The, the movie that's actually number one at the box office is one that actually surprised me because I expected Ready player one which was number one at the box office last week to be number one this week amazingly it wasn't but number one at the box office debuting at number one is a quiet place one of the five movies i'm going to be reviewing for you for this show it opened up this weekend at 50.2 million dollars that's five zero point two million dollars and that is against a budget of 17 million dollars one seven so it made literally Almost three times its budget in its first weekend in the United States alone. Around the world, it has grossed a total of $71.2 million, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, so very good for A Quiet Place. Ready Player One is not number one this week, but it's still doing relatively well for itself. It's number two at the box office this week, falling just one spot, earning just $24.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Ready Player One has so far earned $96.5 million here in the States and $393.6 million worldwide. I am actually surprised that it hasn't made all its budget back this past week or rather this weekend as as opposed to last weekend but it's still doing relatively well for itself but it's not a hit yet here in the states around the world though it is most certainly a certified hit by quite a bit Blockers also debuted this week at number 3 making it the second highest grossing debut movie of the week grossing 20.6 million dollars here in the states against a budget of 21 million dollars so it's not a hit yet but it is very very close to making all its money back here in the states around the world is 32.1 million dollars it's made so that means that it's not a hit yet here in the states but very close to being a tentative hit and around the world it is already a tentative hit Black Panther was number three at the box office last week. This week it slowed, sl- slid to number four at the box office, having made $8.7 million, which comparatively isn't very much, but I'm just going to tell you this right off the bat. Black Panther, in case you didn't know, is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Specifically, against a budget of $200 million, Black Panther has made $665.6 million here in the States and $1.3 billion worldwide. As a matter of fact, it's very, very close to catching up to Star Wars The Last Jedi from this past December in terms of how much it's going to make. So that is very impressive for this movie. And my guess is you're probably going to still see this movie in the top 10 when Avengers Infinity War comes out in a few weeks. But of course, we'll have to see. Tyler Perry's Acrimony is number five at the box office this week in its second week in release, sliding from number two last week, having made $8.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $20 million, Acrimony has so far made $31.7 million in the United States, making it a tentative hit in the United States. I have no information on how this movie did worldwide. I Can Only Imagine is number six at the box office this weekend, and actually a pretty good segue because I can only imagine what Acrimony made at the international box office but bad puns aside i can only imagine the movie made 7.8 million dollars this past weekend sliding from number four last week to number six this week against a budget of seven million dollars though i can only imagine so far made 68.5 million dollars which makes it a certified hit here in the states and while i don't have the exact numbers for how it did worldwide i can tell you that vicariously i can only imagine because it is a certified hit in the united states it is also a certified hit around the world Chappaquiddick is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week and number seven at the box office having grossed 5.8 million dollars now Chappaquiddick Chappaquiddick, if I said Chappaquiddick, I apologize. It's Chappaquiddick, and it's the true story about Ted Kennedy and one of the things that jeopardized his career and his life, one of the events. This is not one of the movies I've seen, but I actually kind of want to see it. But maybe I'll see it for you next week. But either way, Chappaquiddick made... 
$5.8 million against an undisclosed budget. So I can't tell you right now what kind of hit Chappaquiddick is, but it probably is not a hit if it just made $5.8 million. But of course, I am just speculating. Sherlock Gnomes, which is the sequel to Gnomeo and Juliet, is not doing especially well. It is number eight at the box office, sliding from number six last week, having made $5.4 million this weekend. Against a budget of $59 million, Sherlock Gnomes has so far made $33.7 million here in the States and $45.8 million worldwide. Now, here's an interesting thing about Sherlock Gnomes. While it is the sequel to Gnomeo and Juliet, Unlike Gnomeo and Juliet, Sherlock Holmes has not been released in the theaters by the Walt Disney Company, which I find very interesting. But it's probably good that the mouse took his hands off of this one because it is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. And my guess is it probably won't be, especially given the numbers it's pulled in so far. And I would not be surprised to just not see this movie in the top ten come next week. But of course, as always, we'll have to see. Pacific Rim Uprising is number 9 at the box office, taking a big dive from number 5 last week, having made just $4.8 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $150 million, Pacific Rim Uprising has so far only made $54.8 million here in the States and $266.9 million worldwide. So Pacific Rim Uprising is not a hit here in the States and probably will never be since it has $100 million more to go to recoup its losses, but around the world, it actually is a tentative hit, so there is some hope for Pacific Rim Uprising, but probably not as much hope as for its original film directed by Guillermo del Toro. And finally, number 10 at the box office is a movie that actually has been out for three weeks, and it just made its debut in the top 10 this week. It's the movie Isle of Dogs, which... Just putting my personal opinion in there, I raved about this film last week. But this week, people are finally starting to catch on to this movie and how special it is. Isle of Dogs grossed $4.6 million this past weekend. Against an undisclosed budget, Isle of Dogs has so far made $12 million here in the States and $17.5 million worldwide. So... Even though it's made a decent amount of money here in the States and around the world, I cannot say for sure what kind of hit or what kind of flop it is because I do not know its budget. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. The dad joke. <laughs> Corny, grown worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. So take a moment to make your kid laugh, because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio, Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on Somerville Community Access TV or some TV station somewhere in the country that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, this time on my own personal page because the tablet in the studio is not able to get me to the Boston Free Radio Facebook page, but either way you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Quiet Place. This is the movie that is the directorial debut of John Krasinski, best known, actually he's a Newton, Massachusetts native, as Jim Halpert in the long-running TV show The Office. But as an actor, he's had several credits to his name. As a matter of fact, there is a TV series that's coming out very soon that's probably going to be on some streaming service where he plays Jack Ryan, the character from the Tom Clancy movies. And 
Oh, actually, I'm I'm sorry. I did everything I've said about his acting credits has so far been true, but I was incorrect when I said that this is his directorial debut. He actually directed an independent film called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, which was based on a book by David Foster Wallace, and he also directed one in 2016 called The Hollers. Neither of them I've actually seen, but let me just say that this is his directorial debut with a horror movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with that, other than a quirky or romantic comedy. And this is certainly new territory for John Krasinski as an actor and as a director, let alone as a screenwriter, because he actually collaborated on the screenplay with Brian Woods and Scott Beck, who are horror movie veterans who have done such horror films as Spread from two, 2012 and Nightlight from 2015, amongst other movies but either way a quiet place is a movie that reminded me in a lot of instances of i am legend or the omega man in the sense that there are, there's this family who's surviving together at the end of the world they might seem to be alone but they're actually not so there was that comparison it, this movie also reminded me and, and not in a in an unfavorable way of a movie that was out last year which starred Joel Edgerton called It Comes at Night. And this was a movie that critics loved but audiences on the whole hated. I think it was because they expected a horror film and they got something that was a little bit more of a psychological thriller. And there wasn't a, a monster to be scared of for, for instance. But with that said, I, I actually enjoyed It Comes at Night. I thought it w it was one of the best films of the year. It didn't make my top 10 list, but if I had made a top 20 list, it would have made that too. But I compared A Quiet Place to It Comes at Night and I Am Legend or The Omega Man because th it has that similarity in theme, but it, it doesn't take away from the fact that there is a lot of originality in this film maybe not in the story but definitely in a lot of the characters and you're introduced to this family who is forced to literally live in silence except for making a few slight noises while hiding from creatures that hunt by sound and these people in in this movie this this family when you first meet them they're a family of five how many survived the end of the movie I'm not going to tell you, but you're going to have to figure that out on your own. But the point is that I recommend you see the movie and figure it out for yourself. But this family usually doesn't leave the house. And if they do, they have to go barefoot on a trail that has some sort of salt on it or some grain that doesn't make a lot of noise when you step on it. I, I was actually watching that part and I was thinking to myself, would shoes really make that much noise? But I guess you wouldn't want to test it out if, if given that opportunity. And they also basically don't talk to one another. One of the children is deaf. Actually, their oldest daughter in this movie, who is played by M Millicent Simmons and I don't remember seeing Millicent Simmons in a number of other movies she was actually in a movie called Wonderstruck where she also played uh, a deaf girl I, I don't know for sure whether or not she actually is deaf in real life but my guess is she probably is especially given her previous role in Wonderstruck but the father in this movie is played by director John Krasinski and the mother in this movie is played by Emily Blunt and even though so the children in this film, Millicent Simmons, Noah Jupe, and Cade Woodward, don't look like either John Krasinski or Emily Blunt. To all the actors' credits, they had me completely sold that they were a functional family unit. John Krasinski and Emily Blunt are married in real life, but they they have they have children too, but they're very small. I don't think any of them are older than three years old so in this film they have older children who obviously aren't theirs in real life but i really felt that sense of a family bond as i was watching the film and that was one of the biggest assets of the film of course the asset that really counts is the fear is the feeling of dread and also partly wanting to know what the monsters look like and you do get a brief glimpse of the monsters who are haunting this family and ultimately the world but that's not the biggest selling point of this film instead it's it's basically what i think made 
it comes at night scary. You don't have to see a monster to be scared. You really have to almost feel the monster's presence and also have that feeling of dread with you. And that's something that some of the best directors, horror movie directors, like Alfred Hitchcock, got perfectly. It's not the monster, it's the dread, it's the suspense that really drives this this kind of tension. And I absolutely loved A Quiet Place. One of the big drawbacks of the movie that actually might be a compliment is you're introduced to this family in the movie on day 79, apparently, of the end of the world, and then it skips forward to a year later. And what I wanted to know is what happened on day one. Maybe we'll figure that out in a sequel or a prequel to this movie. And there have been speculation that A Quiet Place might be like the Cloverfield films in that there won't be just one film. There will be several that might seem unrelated but are actually linked together by one common plot thread. So I look forward to seeing whatever world or whatever cinematic universe comes out of A Quiet Place. But as a standalone movie, it is one of the best horror films I've seen in a while, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It is top-notch acting from both John Krasinski and Emily Blunt particularly, but also the the kids who played their children. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful Me Club. Save the date, Saturday, September 29th for the 4th annual Evolution of Hip Hop Festival. Hi, I am Yvette and I am the creative director for the Hip Hop Festival. Please join the Somerville Arts Council, Somerville Media Center, the Somerville Line, What's the Word Radio, to celebrate this wonderful event, Saturday, September 29th, 2018, from 3 to 7 p.m. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing... <laughs> The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you, before I trip over my words, is Blockers. This is the latest comedy from director Kay Cannon, who is actually making her directorial debut with this movie. This much I know for sure. And for those of you who don't know who Kay Cannon is, she's actually a comedy writer and an actress. And probably the... The films for which she is best known for writing are the Pitch Perfect movies, at least the first two. She wrote the screenplay for the original one from 2012. She wrote, I, I think, the story in the screenplay for Pitch Perfect 2. And, oh, actually, not to sound redundant, she also co-wrote the screenplay and the story for Pitch Perfect 3. So she has a lot of experience in comedy, and this is the first time she's actually in a directorial role and not actually in a writing role. The writers of this film are Brian and Jim Kehoe, who I can only gather are related somehow whether or not they're brothers or father and son probably brothers maybe cousins i don't know that much i should have done my research before this but blockers is a comedy which i guess you could call a romantic comedy but it's also i think probably more specifically a high school comedy uh, this time from the point of view of three parents who are trying to stop their daughters from having sex on prom night so the parents in this movie are leslie mann who you wouldn't who you would probably be least like let me let me put it to you this way she is most likely to pay, play a parent in a movie because she's played it in so many other uh, comedies particularly ones directed by her husband judd apatow but the other two actors who play the parents of these precocious teenage daughters are john cena the WWE star who's actually coming into his own as an actor and also Ike Barinholst and Ike Barinholst's name is not particularly well known but you definitely know him when you see his face he was he played Seth Rogen's best friend in both neighbors movies he had a recurring role on the Mindy project and he I I shouldn't say a recurring role. He was a regular on The Mindy Project, which was a really good sitcom. And he also played the rogue 
Prison Guard in Suicide Squad, amongst other films. He's a very funny actor, and he, he does well in this movie. So, Blockers, of course, details these three parents who, when they come across a an emoji text conversation between their three best friend uh, daughters who are in their senior year of high school and on their way to prom, they eventually decode that they are having a pact for the three of them to lose their virginity by the time prom night ends. So, of course, it sends these relatively overprotective parents into a bit of a tailspin to try to get their daughters to stop to not lose their virginity and make what could eventually be the biggest mistake of their lives. So what I liked about this film is not only the fact that there were there were teenage girls in this film who were the subject, but I also really liked the fact that the three girls who played the teenage daughters, who are specifically Catherine Newton, who played Leslie Mann's daughter, Geraldine Viswanathan, who plays John Cena's daughter, and Ramona Young, who plays Ike Barinholtz's daughters, I liked the fact that they were compelling characters. And one of the things that I've seen in my experience, not only watching films, but also critiquing films for this show is when movie uh, comedies about parenting only work when the children are developed characters and one of the mistakes that a lot of other parenting comedies make and the one that comes particularly to mind is bad moms is that they do a great job developing the parents or in, in bad mom's case the mother but they don't do such a great job developing the other characters in the film especially the children and i thought that was the biggest weakness of bad moms but fortunately i think the director and writers of this film and maybe even some of the producers knew to make these characters compelling not just these horny teenagers who are just looking for any reason to get laid with just about any guy they they encounter it's not like that at all as a matter of fact there's there's a lot going there that that i won't exactly reveal and the other thing i liked about this film particularly i expected leslie mann and ike barinholtz to be funny and they were certainly in their own way but i was especially impressed with john cena in his role i think he is probably the second best actor to come out of the wwe circle second only to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And Dwayne The Rock Johnson has set the bar so high for former wrestlers who who turn into actors. I think he even set it above Andre the Giant in his role in The Princess Bride. But unlike Andre the Giant, Dwayne Johnson has played against type several times. And here, John Cena plays against type. He's not just a tough guy. He's not just an imposing figure. In fact, I don't think he's even really imposing in this film at all. He plays a really sweet, well-meaning father. And he's he also definitely has his comedic moments, which I think is the very first time that John Cena has shown versatility in a role that's not animated and as a matter of fact i thought he showed a lot of versatility as an actor ironically enough in the animated movie ferdinand where he played the titular character but he hasn't done so just being himself in a live action movie on screen here i think he did that very well and i think about 80 percent of the gags in the movie blockers work really well there are only two instances where i really didn't laugh but there were plenty of people in my screening room who actually Actually did there was one scene where these teenagers after getting out of prom challenge john cena to a beer chugging contest and it turns out it's not just taking the red cups and chugging them back it's actually taking a funnel inserting one end into your rectum and chugging beer that way at first i thought to myself oh come on that is a cheap gag and it is a cheap gag but it turns out some people actually do this and actually believe that they're going to get more drunk this way it just i don't know i I thought it was played for very cheap laughs there's another vomiting gag in a limousine that i didn't think really worked but blockers although overall i i enjoyed it very much particularly because when it was not desperate to make you laugh with cheap gags it worked and it gets my rating of a low but still significant knockout because 
John Cena was very funny in this role. The actresses who played the parents' daughters were, were very good. And also made some very good points about girls losing their virginity as opposed to boys. Multiple choice parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you, A, get spiritual? Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. Oh. B. Find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C. Show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Your favorite Boston Free Radio artists will be taking over the airwaves to bring you new and original content. Don't hold your tongue. An SMC speak out Sunday, June 10th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 12 straight hours of live performances, comedy, music, visual art, and more. Find out more and donate now online at supplementmedia.org. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Miracle Season. This is a sports movie about some high school volleyball players, all of whom are women. And after the tragic death of star volleyball player Caroline Line found a team of dispirited high school girls must band together under the guidance of their tough love coach who's played by Helen Hunt in hopes of winning the state championship the movie stars Helen Hunt in the first movie she's been in in quite some time I know she was nominated for an Oscar about five years ago for a film whose name I can't remember but (laughs) and obviously I haven't seen but it's been a while since she's she's been on the big screen, so it's it's good to see her back in movies. The main actress in this film, the one who didn't die, is the team captain by the name of Kelly, who's played by Erin Moriarty, who is a beautiful young actress. She was born in 1994, so that makes her 23 years old. And I've seen her in a couple of other films, such as Captain Fantastic, starring Viggo Mortensen, and also the underrated Bloodfather, which starred Mel Gibson. That was from two years ago. And I I said on my review of Bloodfather that Aaron Moriarty looks like if you took Selena Gomez's body and photoshopped Linda Blair's face onto her body, that you'd get Aaron Moriarty. I, I'm going to just put that out there and say it's a compliment, but <laughs> take that as you will. But either way, I think The Miracle Season is a very well-acted film. The title of the film kind of gives what happens in the end away, kind of. But what really sells this movie is the superb acting in it. i got to say, as, as far as sports movie goes, it's a tad bit predictable. As a matter of fact, when you're introduced to the girl who's about to die, and that is not spoiling much, her name is Caroline Found, best known to her friends and family as Line, and she's played in this movie by Danica Yarosh, who is also a beautiful young actress. She's a little younger than Aaron Moriarty, about uh, four years younger. And interestingly enough, th- this is quite coincidental. Danica Yarosh was in the movie Jack Reacher Never Go Back, where she plays the precocious daughter of a guy who's on the run, which is exactly the role that Aaron Moriarty played in the Mel Gibson movie Bloodfather. That is quite a coincidence. And I... I, I think you could call that a coincidence because I don't think they would have been hired for a sports movie if they had been in a film or been in a similar film like that, which also came out in 2016. But I thought I'd throw that out there. But when you're introduced to Line, you hear Aaron Moriarty's character say over voiceover, she's the kind of friend who lived life to her fullest. And without me knowing that she was going to die. She dies about 20 minutes into the film. I was immediately reminded of the the scenes in the very beginning of the movie Walk Hard, which was the Dewey Cox story uh, starring uh, John C. Riley, where you're introduced to Dewey Cox and you have his brother who's who's playing this concerto on the piano and he, he says, hey Dewey, let's go out and play. We're young and, and we've got our whole lives ahead of us, which was kind of the... <laughs> Kind of the foreshadowing that this kid's going to die, and he's going to die very painfully. So, yeah, it was it was sort of the same sort of cliched setup with this line character. But admittedly, when line dies, 
the way everyone reacts from Aaron Moriarty's character to Helen Hunt's character to her father, Ernie, who's played by William Hurt, I was really heartbroken watching some of these scenes of the wake of the funeral of the aftermath of of this death and everyone in this film who was affected by her death really showed their emotion and actually got me choked up a little bit as i was as as i was watching this and maybe even as i'm thinking about it right now but of course the the setup to the miracle season is even before line dies it's established that this volleyball team in this small town in Iowa won the state championships the year before in 2010. This takes place in 2011. And Helen Hunt's character emphasizes that lots of volleyball teams have won the states, but almost no teams in Iowa have won the state championships two years in a row. So they are coming back from a win, but now that they one of their star players and their team captain has passed on, they have something else to prove. Of course, this is made difficult not only by the fact that their star captain is dead, but also the fact that at first, not many of the volleyball players, especially Aaron Moriarty's character Kelly, want to show up for practice anymore. So that puts them at a huge disadvantage when they forfeit a vast majority of their games in the beginning of the season and have to have 15 wins in a row in order to make it to the playoffs, let alone the state champions ships so i'm not going to tell you whether or not they win the state championships in the end the the title of the movie the miracle season does kind of give away what happens but it <clears throat> it doesn't give it away entirely but either way i did think that not only were the scenes where people were grieving over the death of line very profound and 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 very compelling but some of the the scenes of practice and the games except for the state championship game were a little brushed over i thought um not the this the the games where they lost but more of the games where they won and i i guess there's a little bit of that balancing act there where you have to determine what games are the most important but i did think that one of the games maybe the game that determined whether or not they made it to the playoffs should have been emphasized as much maybe just a tad bit less than the state championship match but then again, that's me. I think that as far as the miracle season goes, it is, it is based on a true story about a real school in Iowa. And it, I, I guess it inevitably falls victim to some sports movie cliches, but nothing about this film felt unrealistic. So for that reason, I'm still kind of torn as I'm talking about this, giving this movie either a checkout, which is my okay rating, or a knockout, which is my great rating. But I give it a very high checkout because I did think that the performances in this film, particularly when the characters were sad, really sold this film. I think that it probably could have used more emphasis on some of the individual matches that weren't the state championships. Other than that, I actually liked it. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. You're listening to Boston Free Radio. All things fresh, live, and local on bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, 
old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Finding Your Feet. This is a comedy drama, which is a bit formulaic. It's about, well, I, I think in terms of theme, but there's a lot of originality that actually goes into the film. And I do have to say right off the bat, what it lacks in maybe originality of story, it makes up for in charm. With that said, what is Finding Your Feet about? It is about a woman who is on the eve of a retirement, a middle class... Oh, okay, hang on. <laughs> Let me read that synopsis again. On the eve of retirement, a middle class judgmental snob, played by Academy Award nominee Imelda Staunton, discovers her husband has been having an affair with her best friend after 35 years of marriage... And is forced into exile with her bohemian sister, who is played by Celia Imry, who lives on an improver who lives on an impoverished inner city council estate in London. And she has a live-in roommate who is a man named Charlie, who's played by Timothy Spall. And even though the two live together, they're not in any romantic relationship. As a matter of fact, Timothy Spall is still married to a woman who is in late-stage Alzheimer's. So, Imelda Staunton's character, Sandra, and her bohemian sister, Biff, hadn't seen each other in years. And once you actually see the kind of clothes that Imelda Staunton's character wears versus the ones that Celia Imrie wears, you can tell just how different these sisters are and how much they've drifted apart as the years have gone on. So... It is painful to to watch a movie where you see this seemingly happily married couple or a, a couple that's doing well, and then you find out after so many years, even though you've only known the couple for about 10 minutes, that one of them is cheating on his law... <laughs> His his wife of of so many years, or th there are sometimes where it's the, it's the husband too, but mostly it's the the wife being cheated on. But in any way, it, it's a it's a film it, it's a theme that's been in several films before. But I, I think you can sense from the acting in this film the the real heartbreak of it, and you you do feel bad for Imelda Staunton when when you see her on screen. But once you, you see her moving into a flat with her bohemian sister you kind of also think well i can understand her pain but at the same time i can understand why all the characters in this film want her to loosen up and sure enough she begins to loosen up when two things happen number one she reluctantly joins a dance class with biff and charlie and also and also when she finds out that biff has a condition what condition I can't exactly tell you, but it does have to do with being a matter of life and death. And from that point on, I'm very reluctant to tell you any more plot details. Not because there are any particular plot twists. There are some very surprising moments, but there are also some very funny moments. And I think that adults, especially older adults... Maybe not senior citizens, but maybe even Generation Xers will really like this movie. There's a lot that is poignant about this film, both when Imelda Staunton's character is in her state of misery and also when she breaks out of it. And actually, there are a number of really great scenes in this film. Um, there, there are some in the dance class, although the, the the dancing wasn't as emphasized in this film as I thought it would be. There, there's a number of scenes that take place in the the dance practice hall, but th th there's not so much of an emphasis on dancing, or at least I, I would have expected a greater emphasis, especially for a movie called Finding Your Feet. But fortunately, there's a lot of great character interaction. I think that Imelda Staunton and Timothy Spall 
played very well uh, alongside each other. And don't get me wrong, Imelda Staunton and Celia er- Emery played believable sisters, even though they don't look too much alike. But the the spark that lights up between Timothy Spall and Imelda Staunton is really genuine. And I was especially impressed by Timothy Spall's performance in this film because it's been a while since I've seen Timothy Spall in a comedy, and I don't think I have ever seen him in a romantic comedy. Usually, if, if, he's, if he's in... Um, a, a drama like Almost Famous, in which he was really great. He's usually kind of the comic relief. So you definitely know, especially from movies like Almost Famous, that Timothy Spall does have a sense of humor and certainly has a great amount of comic timing. But he, I've never seen him in a romantic comedy before. Has he been in some in his, in his native Great Britain? I'm sure he has. I just haven't seen him in any. But for those... American audiences who are not quite as familiar with Timothy Spall's comedic acting, I think a lot of people will be pleasantly surprised when they see this film. As, as far as plot developments go, the, the story arc is about the same as if you'd seen maybe a Tyler Perry film, but trust me when I say that, don't, don't trust that, don't assume that the similarities in theme between Tyler Perry films and this film, Finding Your Feet, means that the acting caliber is on on cue with Tyler Perry's. It is far beyond that of a Tyler Perry romantic comedy, that I can assure you. In fact, one of my favorite scenes in this film was when Imelda Staunton's character is in the same social circle as her her dance crew which includes her sister and they go out to a pub and as it so happens her soon to be ex-husband and his mistress are at that same pub i thought the way that both imelda staunton told her soon to be ex-husband off and the way the other people in the bar not just her friends including the bartender reacted to that was classic i absolutely loved that part so finding your feet i i hate to just rip this film because it's not particularly original what i loved about it is the characters and i i didn't even mention joanna lumley who is who's best known to american audiences for being in the TV show and the movie Ab Fab. But here she plays somebody who's not quite the same character as she plays in Ab Fab, but it's still very funny. And Finding Your Feet is definitely a very pleasant surprise, especially given the the, the mund- or the rather hackneyed plot. But it gets my rating of a knockout. I think that young people are going to like that. I especially think that older people are going to love this movie. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. I love those real six signs. The ones that move me. The thinly blow. New rocky toe. All this and more on Unpacked Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to. Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. I was just about to say the next movie I was going to review as the title of the show. (laughs) So I I stopped myself there. But the next movie I'm going to review for you is All the Money in the World. And I, I was very, very close to saying, welcome back to All the Money in the World, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. But I stopped myself until I told you how exactly I was going to screw up. But All the Money in the World is a movie that came out on Christmas Day last year, 2017, and it's a movie I did see around the time it came out, but I didn't get to review it, and as a matter of fact, 
it's on my list, or it's going to be off my list very soon, of movies I've seen but haven't reviewed for this show yet. But there's a reason I'm reviewing it this week, and the reason is that the movie comes out today on DVD and Blu-ray and is now available to watch on Amazon Prime. That, by the way, is not an advertisement for Amazon Prime. I'm just telling you that... It is available for streaming on Amazon Prime. It might be available for streaming on Hulu or Netflix, but I do not know at the moment. But either way, it is available, not in theaters, so whether or not I recommend you see it, I'm going to tell you in just a moment. So All the Money in the World is the latest from director Ridley Scott, and it tells the true story of the kidnapping of 16-year-old John Paul Getty III and the desperate attempt by his devoted mother to convince his billionaire grandfather, Jean Paul Getty, I suppose the first, to pay the ransom. And this movie made a lot of headlines last year, particularly because the original person who was going to play John Paul Getty the first was Kevin Spacey. But then Kevin Spacey got hit with a massive sexual assault scandal, and Ridley Scott, rather than releasing the movie as it was, made the bold decision to recast John Paul Getty, this time with Christopher Plummer in the role, and take out all of Kevin Spacey's scenes. I did think that was a drastic move. I don't condone at all what Kevin Spacey did allegedly i mean whether or not he did it this the sexual a sexual blah, blah, the sexual assault scandals it was wrong it, it was wrong and i think kevin spacey is experiencing the punishment he deserves with that said i didn't think that taking him out of the movie was was a necessary thing to do and eventually, I would like to see the, the version of All the Money in the World with Kevin Spacey as John Paul Getty. But having said that, again, doing a little bit of a segue, Christopher Plummer does an amazing job in this movie as John Paul Getty. And if there was any actor to replace Kevin Spacey on the fly, Christopher Plummer steps up and nails this role. As a matter of fact, he was nominated for an Oscar for this role. It was well-deserved. I didn't think he, he should have beat Gary Oldman for his role in Darkest Hour, but Christopher Plummer now holds the record for being the oldest actor ever to be nominated in the Best Actor in a Leading Role category, and maybe even in the Supporting Role Acting category, too. I don't know that for sure, but I do know he holds the record for Best Actor in a Leading Role, and it is very well deserved. He does an amazing job in this film. So, of course, he plays a, a billionaire who's not necessarily heartless, but he does make a controversial t decision not to pay the ransom to the kidnappers of his 16 year old grandson and on the one hand a lot of people particularly those who don't have money can say that that's that's selfish he has the money why doesn't he just pay the ransom but on the other hand you if if you were to pay money to every single person who kidnapped a family member of yours i think everybody would go through great lengths in theory to kidnap any family member of yours to make a quick buck it, it's it seems simple obviously kidnapping is is a lot more complicated than that but this movie deals with the complexity of that controversial decision by oil magnate john paul getty and especially how john paul getty the third's mother who's played in this movie very well by michelle williams deals with that decision michelle williams character by the name is named by the way is named gail harris who also has a cantankerous relationship with her ex-husband in the movie, John Paul Getty II, who is played by Andrew Bucknan, or B-U-C-H-A-N. I'm going to pronounce it Bucknan. I might be wrong about that. But the grandson, or the 16-year-old grandson of John Paul Getty III, is actually named Charlie Plummer, and I believe he is Christopher Plummer's grandson in real life i don't have time to look that up right now as i'm doing my show but it it's probably true but either way he, d he does a really good job in this film as well it's hard to measure up to actors like michelle williams and christopher Plummer, but charlie Plummer does certainly hold his own there's also a, a good supporting performance in this movie again 
grossly overshadowed by Christopher Plummer and Michelle Williams, but still noteworthy. And it did fall into a little bit of controversy because J. J. Paul Getty's lawyer in this movie is Fletcher Chase, who's played by Mark Wahlberg. And the controversy surrounding this film is, of course, with Kevin Spacey being edited out of the movie, all the scenes with Christopher Plummer had to require a few actors, including Michelle Williams and Mark Wahlberg, to reshoot their roles and the controversy was that mark Wahlberg was paid more for his reshoots than michelle williams again that's another scene i or another move that i don't condone and i'm actually really proud of the hollywood community for calling the filmmakers maybe not necessarily ridley scott himself out on this but basically the establishment as a whole because women should not be paid less than men for doing the same work and that is exactly what happened here i do think that puts a bit of a black mark on the the movie itself but more if you know about the making of the film not if you're seeing the film for itself but just this is a compelling true story with a dynamite performance by christopher Plummer, and i've been saying this about every christopher Plummer movie i've seen if he dies tomorrow and hopefully he doesn't but if he does he has one more great film to solidify his career and it goes without saying that all the money in the world gets my rating of a knockout i don't think it was one of my top 10 favorite movies of the year but it certainly was very compelling and christopher Plummer, as i said i can't say enough great things about him he is an amazing actor you're not wired to have a response to this sound you're neutral to it and you can hear it repeatedly without feeling anything but when we introduce a new stimulus save the food we've achieved pulling a natural or inborn response from you save the food because 40 percent of all food in the u.s never gets eaten save the food Cook it, store it, share it. Just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this is usually the part of the show where I get into my last segment, which is what's topping, or rather, what's coming out next. These That's a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. But before I get into that, I just want to give you a brief bit of movie news that just came to my attention right now, thanks in large part to Variety. I just found out, and this is good news, that Daniel Craig has officially confirmed that he will be returning as James Bond in the 25th installment of the long-running franchise. That is great news, because I heard that after Spectre, I heard speculation that Daniel Craig wasn't going to be returning as James Bond, and I said at the time, first of all, Daniel Craig, I think, is the second greatest guy to play James Bond next to Sean Connery. That's debatable, but I think he's done better than Pierce Brosnan, than Timothy Dalton, and arguably better than Roger Moore. So I'd like to see him do that one more time. And I've also felt that You have Robert Downey Jr. having played Tony Stark, and he has played Tony Stark in more movies so far, and that's including Avengers Infinity War, than Daniel Craig and Pierce Brosnan have played James Bond combined. So I figured that Daniel Craig would do it one more time, and this time I'm actually glad he's coming back as James Bond. I mean, would I like to see him in more James Bond movies? Ideally, but then again... you don't want to overextend your welcome. But with that said, let's get into what what's coming out next. And there are a couple of big movies that are coming out this coming weekend. One of the biggest ones, which we'll probably see in the top five, maybe not number one, but we'll have to see, is a movie called Truth or Dare. This is no relation to the Madonna movie. This is a, har- a, a horror movie about a harmless game of truth or dare among friends that turns deadly when someone or something begins to punish those who tell a lie or refuse the dare. 
That sounds really compelling. It sounds like a movie that I'm I'm surprised, as far as I know, hasn't been made before. But yeah, I would love to see that. <laughs> so that is a movie I definitely will see, and I will review it for you for next show. Another movie that's coming out is actually a remake of the Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell movie called Overboard. This time, the movie stars Anna Faris and Eugenio Derbez from How to Be a Latin Lover. And this is a movie about a spoiled, wealthy yacht owner, presumably Anna Faris, who is thrown overboard and becomes the target of revenge from his mistreated Oh, his mistreated employee. Okay, so I guess the spoiled wealthy yacht owner is Eugenio, Eugenio Derbez, and the mistreated employee is Anna Ferris. It's a remake of the 1987 comedy, which I haven't seen, but I'll probably catch that on Netflix before I see this film because, well, I, I, I just like to see the originals before I see the remake. But if you're interested in seeing it, it is coming out in theaters this coming weekend. And I don't know whether or not I'll see that movie, but either way, I'll I'll review something for you next week. Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is one called The Rider. And this is a movie which is a drama, but it has it stars three people with the same last name who I assume are related. It stars Brady Jandro, Tim Jandro, and Lily Jandro. They have to be related because that last name is just too uncommon to be a coincidence. But anyway, The Rider is about a movie or about a young cowboy who, after suffering a near fatal head injury, he undertakes a search for new identity and what it means to be a man in the heartland of America. That sounds like a Clint Eastwood movie or a movie that Clint Eastwood would immediately be drawn to, but it's actually not directed by Clint Eastwood. It's directed by Chloe Zhao, who has not directed any movies I've seen. Uh, She has directed uh, two feature-length films, including The Rider. The one she directed before The Rider was a movie called Songs My Brother Taught Me, and that is a film that was an indie film, and the other films she's directed were short films. But I'd be interested to see that if it's coming out in the theater near me. I'm not guaranteeing that it will come out, but I'm going to look out for that one because it sounds really interesting, and I'd love to check out Chloe Zhao's other film repertoire. And the last movie I'm going to mention for this segment is a movie called Borg vs. McEnroe, excuse me, as in John McEnroe. And this is the story of the 1980s tennis rivalry between the players Bjorn Borg and the volatile John McEnroe. Uh, And Shia LaBeouf plays John McEnroe. And right when I read that, that immediately made me lose interest in the story. But Shia LaBeouf and John McEnroe actually have quite a bit in common in terms of their public persona but it looks interesting will it be great i can never guarantee that but i'm certainly going to see it if i have time but anyway that concludes this week's edition of words on film i am your host and movie critic dan burke and just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on the show words on film about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic dan burke they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole But I've had a great time this week discussing my favorite topic, which is movies. And until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.